Little Fox. The Canterville Ghost, Part Three. For the next three weeks, the Canterville Ghost fulfilled his ghostly obligations as quietly as possible. He wore a thick black cloak, tiptoed lightly in his bare feet, and applied the Rising Sun lubricator to his chains every night. Despite all his precautions, he still didn't escape treachery. He had to be always on the lookout for strings stretched across his path in the dark, or buckets cleverly balanced to spill as he passed. One night, as he was passing through the library door, he thought he saw someone sitting in one of the chairs. Now it's my chance," he whispered to himself. "I'll frighten whoever it is so badly that the whole house will wake with his screams." And he carefully crept up behind the chair. He hovered there for a moment, chuckling to himself, and then leapt out with an evil smile and turned to face his victim. The Canterville ghost let out a wail and fell back in terror. Right in front of him, seated motionless, was a horrible sight. Monstrous hollow eyes peered from a hideous white face. It wore a loose cloak shredded with age, and in its hand was a gleaming sword. Never having seen a ghost before, he was naturally very frightened. He fled all the way back to his room, where he hid his face under a sheet. After a time, when morning was beginning to lighten the sky, the brave Canterville spirit asserted himself, and he decided to go and speak to the other ghost. After all, two ghosts are better than one. He reasoned. When he returned to the spot, it didn't look as if the other ghost had moved. He cleared his throat loudly, but the other didn't stir. Quietly, he reached out to tap his new ally on the shoulder. The head slipped off and rolled onto the floor, and the bones fell in a heap. There, at his feet, was a carved turnip, and on the chair was a pair of broomsticks collapsed under a moth-eaten curtain. The sword was nothing but an everyday kitchen knife. He had been tricked. Feverish with rage, the ghost raised his withered hands above his head, and using the words of an ancient oath. He swore that when the rooster had crowed three times, deeds of bloodshed and murder would descend on the castle. No one would be spared. Nervously, he listened for the rooster's cry. Morning had arrived, and the family would soon be coming down the stairs. He waited, but the rooster never crowed. The ghost was puzzled. This curse had never failed him before. At last, worried that he might be discovered, he gave up his vigil and retreated to his room. There he lay down on his low cot, feeling more dejected than he ever had before in three hundred years. After this, the ghost was not seen again on any nocturnal expedition. At dinner that night, as the Otis family devoured the roast rooster that Mrs. Umney had prepared, they decided the ghost must have left. I think I'll write a letter to Lord Canterville," said Mr. Otis, "and tell him the good news. Perhaps he'd like to come round for a dinner party," said Mrs. Otis with a smile. The twins were a little disappointed, but before long, everyone had found something new to absorb their interest. Washington devoted himself to his studies. The twins explored the grounds, playing cowboys and Indians, and Mrs. Otis invited the best families from around the neighborhood for elaborate parties. Virginia's attention was drawn to the young Duke of Cheshire, who paid her the most extravagant compliments when he visited every weekend. Your eyes sparkle like sunlight dancing on the summer sea. He told her as they rode home from Brockley Meadows late in the summer. Virginia ignored his elaborate flattery and changed the subject. You know, I think I miss the ghost now that he's gone. Oh, I'm sure that you don't mean that. My great uncle met the ghost at the castle once. He was found shivering on the floor the next morning, mumbling "chill of death" over and over. He never said a sane word after that. Virginia didn't know how to reply. She thought these stories involving the Canterville ghost were greatly exaggerated, but she also knew that the young duke had an honest heart and wasn't in the habit of making up stories. They passed an encampment of gypsies, who Mr. Otis had kindly let stay on the castle grounds, and Virginia suggested a shortcut. As their horses slipped through a gap in the hedges, her skirt caught on a branch and tore. "Oh my!" said Virginia, blushing. "Please excuse me." She quickly rode ahead and went up to her room by the back staircase. As she was running past the tapestry chamber, she fancied she saw someone inside. Thinking it was Mrs. Umney, she looked in to ask her to mend her skirt. To her immense surprise, it was the Canterville ghost. He was sitting by the window, watching the yellow leaves fly through the air like strips of autumn gold. His head was leaning on his hand, and his whole attitude suggested extreme depression. Virginia's first instinct was to run away. 
but the ghost looked so melancholy that she was overcome with pity. I'm so sorry for you, she said, but my brothers are going back to school next week, and then, if you behave yourself, no one will annoy you. It is absurd asking me to behave myself, he answered, turning around in astonishment. I have to rattle my chains and groan through keyholes. It's my only reason for existing. It's no reason for existing at all, and you know you have been very wicked. It was you who stole my paints in order to keep up that ridiculous stain in the library. First you took all my reds and purples, and after you took the emerald green, I could paint nothing but boring pictures in black and white. Besides, Mrs. Umney told us that you killed your wife. Well, I admit it, said the ghost. However, my wife is long dead now, and I don't think it was very nice of her brothers to starve me to death. Starve you to death? exclaimed Virginia. Oh, Mr. Ghost, I mean, Sir Simon, are you hungry? I have a sandwich in my room. Would you like it? No, thank you. I never eat anything now. I am so lonely and so unhappy. I haven't slept for three hundred years, he said, and a solitary tear fell from his gray cheek. Trembling a little, Virginia knelt beside him and looked up into his old withered face. Poor ghost, is there no place where you can sleep? He answered in a low, dreamy voice. Far away beyond the pine woods there is a little garden where the hemlock flowers grow. The nightingale sings and the cold crystal moon looks down over the peaceful sleepers. You mean the garden of death, she whispered solemnly. Yes, death, how I long for it. To lie in the brown earth with no yesterday and no tomorrow. To forget time and to sleep at peace. He paused. You can help me, Virginia. As the ghost said her name, a cold shudder ran through Virginia, and she looked around the room. She thought she saw the animals and huntsmen pictured in the tapestries hanging on the walls come to life. Beware, little Virginia, they called to her. Beware. The Canterville Ghost, Part 4 The ghost spoke again, and his voice was quiet and low. Have you ever read the old prophecy on the library window? He asked. Oh, often, said Virginia, turning from the tapestries on the walls to look at him. And she recited the verse from heart. When a golden girl can win prayer from out the lips of sin. When the barren almond bears, and a little child gives away its tears. Then shall all the house be still, and peace come to Canterville. But I don't know what it means, she added. It means, he said sadly, that you must weep with me for my sins and pray with me for my soul, and if you have always been sweet and gentle and good, the angel of death will have mercy on me. A cold shudder ran through her, and she thought gravely for a moment. At last she stood up. I am not afraid, she said firmly, and I will ask the angel to have mercy on you. The ghost rose from his seat, and taking her hand, he bent over it with old-fashioned grace and kissed it. His fingers were as cold as ice, and his lips burned like fire, but Virginia did not tremble. Then, clutching her hand more tightly, Sir Simon of Canterville muttered an incantation. A cold, dark passage opened in the wall, and he pulled her quickly into it. As they passed out of the tapestry chamber, Virginia looked desperately over her shoulder and saw the figures in the tapestries behind her. The animals and huntsmen called out, Beware, Virginia! Your family may never find you again. At dinner time, Virginia's chair at the dining table stood empty. Where is your sister? Mr. Otis asked Washington. She's probably in the garden getting flowers for the table, Washington answered. I'll go get her. But he couldn't find her. When he came back, the family decided to look through the castle. Everyone spread out, calling Virginia's name in all the rooms. When the castle was thoroughly searched and there was no trace of her anywhere, they met in the library. They were all a little worried. It was now evening, and the light outside the tall windows was fading. Perhaps she didn't come home after her ride with the Duke, suggested Mr. Otis. Maybe the gypsies have taken her, cried Mrs. Otis anxiously. Let's not get frantic, Mr. Otis said calmly. I'll ride over to the Cheshire estate right now. I'm sure she's there. While he was gone, Washington took a lamp outside and searched the castle grounds. His mother and the twins searched inside again, opening every closet and cupboard. A short while later, Mr. Otis returned with the Duke of Cheshire, and both their faces were creased with worry. 
When he had heard that Virginia was missing, the young duke had insisted on riding back to help with the search. On the way, they had stopped by the gypsy camp, only to discover that the gypsies had gone. It was evident that the gypsies had left in a hurry, as their fire was still smoking, and some plates had been left on the grass. Straight away, Mr. Otis sent Washington off to the train station to inquire if anyone fitting Virginia's description had been seen on the platform and to dispatch telegrams to the police in all the surrounding districts. Then he and the Duke headed out into the night again to ride for Bexley, a village about four miles away that was known as a gathering place for gypsies. They found not the slightest hint or sign of the missing girl. The gypsies, too, were distressed to hear of Virginia's disappearance, as she had always said hello when she passed their camp, and they remembered her smiling face. Tired and dejected, Mr. Otis and the Duke returned home to find the rest of the family, including Mrs. Umney, waiting at the castle gate with lanterns. There was nothing more that could be done. So everyone went inside to eat a sad and quiet meal, hoping that they would hear something from the police. Just as they were passing out of the dining room, the tall clock in the hall began to strike midnight, and when the last stroke sounded, they heard a crash and a sudden shrill cry. Dreadful thunder shook the castle. A piece of wooden paneling flew off the wall at the top of the staircase, and out onto the landing stepped Virginia, looking very pale and white. In her hands was a small jewelry box of tarnished silver. In a moment they had all rushed up to her. Everyone hugged her, even the twins, and the young duke kissed her several times on the cheek. Thank God you are safe, murmured Mrs. Otis, as she put her arm around the trembling girl. Where have you been? said Mr. Otis rather angrily. We've been riding all over the country looking for you. Father, said Virginia quietly, I have been with the ghost. He is finally at peace, and you must come see him. He was really sorry for all that he had done, and he gave me this box of beautiful jewels before he left. The whole family gazed at her in amazement. With a serious look, she turned around and led them through the opening in the wall and down a narrow secret corridor. Washington followed with a lighted candle, and when they came to the end, the flickering light showed a low room with one tiny barred window. Stretched out on the floor was a gaunt skeleton. Its ankle was chained to the stone wall, and its long, fleshless fingers seemed to grasp at a dusty, mold-filled jug placed just out of its reach. Virginia knelt down and touched the skeleton tenderly. This is where Sir Simon died a horrible death by starvation, she explained. One of the twins went to the small window to look outside and figure out which wing of the castle they were in. Look at that, he called. The old almond tree has blossomed. I can see the flowers in the moonlight. The angel has forgiven him, said Virginia, and as she slowly rose to her feet, the rest of her family looked at her in wonder. Four days after these curious incidents, there was a funeral at Canterville Castle. Eight black horses pulled an old-fashioned carriage that carried an ornately carved coffin. Draped over the coffin was a rich purple cloth embroidered with a Canterville coat of arms. Lord and Lady Canterville came up to the castle to lead the procession for their ancient ancestor, and Virginia rode with them in their carriage. The coffin was lowered into a deep grave under the spreading branches of the almond tree in a quiet corner of the graveyard behind the castle. Years later, the Duke of Cheshire and his beautiful Duchess were visiting Canterville Castle to see Virginia's parents. The young couple had been married the year after Sir Simon's funeral, and at the ceremony, everyone had admired the rare jewels she wore. Whenever she visited the castle, Virginia walked the quiet path to the almond tree to lay a flower on Sir Simon's gravestone. That evening, as she and her husband sat together in the moonlight, a nightingale began to sing in the branches above. Virginia quietly remembered the ghost's description of the Garden of Death when her husband took hold of her hand. Virginia, he said, you never told me what happened when you were locked up with a ghost. Please don't ask me, dear. It is something I cannot tell, she said. She looked at him and paused. Except to say, he made me see what life is and what death means and why love is stronger than both. <laughs>